morning, Zwingli United of Christ. Good morning, Pastor Allen. Uh, nice to be greeted by you all this morning. Hope you all are doing well on this nice and chilly morning. Um, we're glad you're here worshiping with us. Um, just want to give you a few, few prayer requests this morning. We just have two. Um, Lori Carrington, uh, who is Joanne Cramlick's sister, was diagnosed with COVID and is in the hospital. She doesn't have any symptoms, but um, is dealing with that diagnosis. And then for Ed Beeler, who is a friend of um, Earl and Sue Ludwig, uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer back in October. Just prayers for him and for his wife as they suffer through this, this diagnosis. Um, with that said, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning. Spirit of God, running water, flowing to greatness, the trees on the hill. Spirit of God, finger of morning. Will you stand and join me in the call to worship this morning? Come into this time of worship by the new and living way of Christ Jesus. We come with true hearts in full assurance of our faith. Come with joyful expectation. We gather in full confidence of the gospel's promise. Let us praise God together and open ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit that we may encourage and support each other to love our neighbors as ourselves and to be God's instruments of grace. Amen. And let us gather our hearts in prayer. In you, O oh God, we find refuge from our turbulent world. We work each day to bear witness to your justice through our ministries. While the journey towards true peace that lies ahead is long, our incremental steps continue to take us closer to that promised day. Renew in us the strength, faith, and courage we need to persevere so that the promised day will come when your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now let us join together in reading responsively the confession that is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. The church here begins with Advent's hope, the coming of Christ and the reign of God. The last liturgical season, Pentecost, is a time to grow spiritually and faithfully. Today, we are almost at the end of the church year. Despite our labors, individually and collectively, 
Advent's hope remains far away. So let us take this time to confess our sins of omission and commission that keep us afar that day when the sound of weeping across the land will be no more. Despite our best efforts, O God, we have not always lived as we should. Our own short-sightedness and impatience have led us to make choices based upon our immediate needs over your desires. Forgive us for our selfish ways. Have mercy on us, O God. Many of the challenges we have faced have evoked fear in us. We have let these fears at times overwhelm our faith and trust in you. Forgive us for our lack of faith in you. Have mercy on us, O Holy One. We don't always recognize or acknowledge that our reticence to embrace the stranger comes from our own prejudices, O God. When we do not embrace the stranger, we lose the blessings and richness of your beloved community. Forgive us for our biases. We beseech you, O God. Lord, have mercy on us. We see injustices all around, in the papers, on television, on the web, or walking through our community. Yet we often cannot bring ourselves to speak out or take action against them. Forgive us for our silence. We beseech you, O God. Gracious one, forgive us. We know you created this world with enough for everyone, yet in this land of plenty, people know deprivation. We beseech you, O God, Forgive us that we have not done enough to sustain and support the sacredness of the common good. And now let us take time to pray silently for God's forgiveness of our sins. A cord of love binds us to God. God will not allow us to enter Sheol or to see the pit. We are forgiven and saved by God's love for us. Thanks be to God. Sing praises to the living God. God through whom peace reigns. And so I say to you, the peace of God be with you. And also with you. I invite you now to greet each other with signs of peace. How are you doing this morning? Doing good? Yeah? Hi, guys. I really like your masks. This is great. Wow, I like that. That's what we should have, a mask Sunday, where we do all kinds of different colored masks. I think that's a good idea. That's a great idea. So I, I wanted to ask you this morning, and this is kind of a hard question to ask you, but do you ever get upset? Do you ever get a little bit mad? Do you? Yeah, you do? Do you guys get mad sometimes? Yeah, it's hard to believe that you get mad, but yeah, sometimes people will do things to kind of upset you, right? Yeah, like they might call you names, or they might do something that you really don't like, or they might treat a friend that's not very, and they might treat them, you know, in a way that's not very nice, and a lot of times that happens. In our scripture this morning, we're going to hear a word that is called, a word provoke, 
and provoke. Have you heard that word? Provoke, I kind of, when I hear that word, I kind of feel like someone coming up to you and just kind of putting their finger right at you and just sort of pointing at you or something like that. Sort of like this. See this picture? Yeah, sort of like you provoke someone. And when you think of provoking someone, you think of provoking them to anger. That means you do something or say something that causes them to feel upset or angry, like some people might make you feel sometimes or make all of us feel sometimes. But the passage this morning doesn't talk about provoking to anger. What it tells us is to provoke others in love and doing good. So I have another picture for you. This is a picture of Jesus, one of my favorites. See this picture of Jesus laughing? Yeah, we don't talk about Jesus laughing a lot of times, but Jesus, I mean, there were things that he did and others did that probably made him upset, but also provoked him or caused him to laugh or to feel good or to feel love. There's a, there's a Bible verse that says something like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That means treat others in the way you want them to treat you. So be nice and kind to them so that they'll be nice and kind to you. But I think we should also think about doing unto others so that they will do the same thing unto others. Meaning that when we act nice to someone, that maybe they'll act nice to other people. So that when we treat people with kindness, they'll treat other people with kindness. The youth, and some of you may have done this, um, did, they, they often will go out into the community and do random acts of kindness. They'll put notes on mirrors that will say something like, have a good day, or they'll help people with their bags and carry them to the car, or they'll do other things, these random acts of kindness. And they do that partly to make the people feel good, but I think also to make them think about being kind to other people. So that's a, that's a really good thing. And we do things here to try to provoke people to kindness. Like what we're doing here today is worship. And doing when we're here in worship and we're gathering together and we're treat, e, treating each one you know, really in a really nice and kind way, and we talk about those kinds of things from the pulpit or in the children's moment, we hope that we, we hear those things and then we go out into the world and do what we've been taught to do, which is to be kind to other people, to love them, to do good deeds, to help people when you can. Uh, maybe when your parents are needing some help or they're having a hard day, just go and say, can I help you with something? I think that would really make your mother or father feel really good. And I know they do things for you, too, that make you feel really good. So, yeah, I see, I see, yeah, I'm not sure if many of us are really sure about doing that thing for our parents, but I think it'll really help them. I think, it, don't you think, parents, don't you think that'd be a good thing? Yes, so, um, so, you know, hopefully you can do something like that either for your parents or for your friends or just for some stranger who needs help. So let us go to God and thank God for the chances to come to worship and to learn about how to do good deeds and to love one another and let us pray that God will help us to go out and do those things too. So let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this, all of these people here who love one another, who treat one another with kindness, who show each other what it means and how to love and to do good things in the world. And we also ask you to help each one of us to go out into the world and be your love for other people, to go out and do good things that you have called us to do. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks. I think it might take a little convincing to you know, help out the parent thing, so, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll pray that we'll all help one another out as best that we can. Our first scripture reading this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with the 11th verse. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool at his feet. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. 
And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And here's the words that I talked about this morning in the children's moment. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. May God bless these words, and may you hear them, and may they sink into your heart and soul. Thank you. 
Our scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of birth pains. May God add a blessing to the hearing of these words. As we were reminded this morning in our confession, We're in the midst of the season of Pentecost. It's the longest season of the church calendar year, and it's also called ordinary time. And it's in this time, in the ordinariness of life, when we learn what it means to be a follower of the way. In other words, it's the season of learning how to live out the ways of Jesus in all of the ordinary days of our lives. It's the season where we learn to persevere. Christmas and Advent seem far off, even though Advent is just around the corner where we wait and we expect for that Christ child. That's right, we're coming to the close of the Christian calendar year, and it starts again November 28th with the season of Advent with all of the joy and the anticipation Advent brings to our hearts and our lives, but yet we still have to live into the ordinariness of our lives. And in this next two weeks, we are reminded of what it is like to be a faithful follower of Jesus, even when life seems turbulent, problematic, ordinary. In our Hebrews passage today, we are reminded of God's faithfulness, that God does the work in our relationship to make us reconciled to God. God has given us his son to write our relationship to God. How does God do this? By giving us the example of how to live in the ordinary times of life, in adversity, and the world wants to hang you for treason. And we're shown how we are to respond. Hebrews says, let us approach God with newfound confidence that God has made possible. God has taken the initiative and done the work. Let us provoke. I love that you talked about that in the children's uh, sermon this morning, Butch. That word is so visceral. Let's provoke one another to do good deeds. Spur each other on, not tear each other down. God has been gracious to us. Therefore, let us be gracious to one another. Provoking on and good. In this passage of Hebrews, there's a lot of talk about Jesus being the high priest and the nature of God's sacrifice and the significance of the meaning behind all of that. There are, a lot of, there are a variety of theological thoughts on this matter, but it all boils down to three simple things. Living in hope, living out kindness, and living in community with one another. The author of Hebrews encouraged us to meet together regularly in community. Now, hear me when I say this. I have everything to gain by encouraging you to gather together as the church. It's Butch's and mine's job 
to encourage you, to teach you, to equip you to live out your life in faith, to get in Bible, get involved in Bible studies and choir, being a Sunday school teacher, visiting the sick, having dinner with people, inviting you to various church events. But the author makes it perfectly clear part of the marks of a faithful and effective Christian is gathering together in worship and fellowship and study and prayer. Being together is how we grow and how we become better disciples and how we learn to walk in the ways of Jesus. Some people will say, I commune with God in nature and I don't need to go to church on Sunday mornings. There's just too many problems going to church. That's good and fine to commune with God in nature. I love nature. I love to go to the mountains. I love to go to the beach. I love to get out and do those things. There's something about that that's very God-centering. But if all we ever do is commune with God in time by ourselves, we can be separated from God in some very powerful ways. We miss out on the edification of teaching of each other, the learning from each other as we grapple. We each of us grapple with our faith and we teach each other things in that grappling. It helps to provoke us on in our faith. And it's important for our growth in learning to love God better, to be better followers of Christ and following God in all the ways that are marked out for us. I remember at one time a professor of mine said, if all you ever do is gather with God by yourself, you'll have some great insights. But left to your own devices, that will eventually fail because there's no one else there to provoke you on, to grapple with your faith, to push you forward, try on new theological hats and see how they feel if this maybe fits with your experience of God. Do these things ring true? It helps us to grow. Time away in solitude in nature is important. And we should do that to restore our souls, but don't make it our only spiritual practice. Jesus lived that out an example to us. He took time away frequently and then came back to be in fellowship with his disciples. And then our gospel lesson today continues this lesson. It further expands upon what we just learned. The writer of Mark chapter 13 takes us back to the days when the temple was in existence. Is in existence. The disciples are awed by the beauty and majesty of the temple. The opulence is something to behold. And Jesus says to them, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on the other. Every stone is going to be thrown down. A prophecy of the future? Yes, but more so, prophecies in Jesus' time served a different purpose than what we're used to hearing. Prophecies in our present time are often about predicting the future solely, but in Jesus' time, they were used to exhort, uplift, and to encourage. And so Jesus says and explains what he meant when the disciples first asked Jesus when these things are going to happen and when these things are going to be fulfilled, Jesus takes time to explain what he means. He explains that they're missing the point. He says to them, don't look for signs of the end times. And as Jesus does this, my mind is recalling some of the other places in the Bible that tells us that no one will ever know when the end is near. Not even Jesus knows that. Only God and God alone. Jesus encourages them and says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am Jesus or God and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumor of war, rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. He goes on to say later on in this passage, brother will betray brother to death 
and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. In other words, Jesus is saying here, these things are going to happen. They are the ordinary happenings in life. Many will come claiming to be my messenger. Many are going to be deceived. There's going to be plenty of wars, plenty of rumors of wars. You're going to see earthquakes. You're going to see nations rising up against nation, fighting with one another, even internally. People are going to hate one another. But these things we should expect to happen. And don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed by all of this chaos. I am with you. I am is with you. So stand firm in the faith to the end and you'll be saved. In other words, don't pile on to the pressure when others go negative politically. Don't lash out at others who have views you maybe think are a little bit ridiculous. Keep living out love, speaking truth to power, but also being caring, kind, and compassionate, no matter what. When some to someone talks about end time prophecy and the signs that God is coming, hold steadfast and know that indeed God is coming and we should always be ready. But don't say a word of negativity. Don't rise up in violence or harsh words against the person. Don't rise up against a person who has a different point of view than you speaking horrible things to them. Choose the way of compassion and nonviolence in both our words and our deeds. Choose forgiveness and grace. And as someone told me, another way of thinking of the golden rule, do no harm to anyone else. Don't hurt their heart. In tragedy and oppression, it's easy to join in the revolution, in violence, in words and deeds, or to lash out and blame to those we perceive are causing the conflict. Jesus wasn't about engaging in violence to overthrow the temple or Rome. Again and again, Jesus chose the way of compassion and nonviolence, forgiveness and grace. And again, I say to you, I've told you these things are going to happen. Don't join in with others' activities. Continue to be faithful in the ways of Christ because God is faithful. Keep the faith no matter what your eyes or feelings may tell you. When these bad things happen, remember that God is not abandoning us. God is very much with us till the end. As we continue the good work of being the church, we need to hold each other up. We need to speak the truth and love to those who are wrong, but always living out of love, not words of violence. God is hope. And we are God's hope in the world, in the midst of the craziness. And so as I close out this morning, I encourage you that these words and lessons are things we can live by as time draws on further and further away from the time of Jesus. These are words and lessons to draw on as we get heavy-eyed, holding out hope of Christ's return. These are the words of hope to sustain all the days of our lives when life seems ordinary or even out of control. These are the words that, of hope that sustain us when the world looks very, very different than it did two years ago. May you continue to be centered in the way of Christ, living out love, compassion, self-care, caring for one another, and living a life of nonviolence in words and deeds. 
And may you remember that God is there in the midst of the ordinariness of life. May you always be learning and growing in the ways of Christ. May it be so, Zwingli United Church of Christ. Amen. <laughs>now let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God, who is love, and who has given the earth to all people. We believe in Jesus Christ, who came to heal us and to free us from all forms of oppression. We believe in the Spirit of God, who works in and through all who are turned towards the truth. We believe in the community of faith, which is called to be at service of all people. We believe in God's promise to finally destroy the power of sin in us all and to establish the kingdom of justice and peace of all humankind. We do not believe in the right of the strongest, nor the force of arms, nor the power of oppression. We believe in human, human rights, rights and, and the solidarity of all people and the power of nonviolence. We do not believe in racism and the power that comes from wealth and privilege or in any established order that enslaves. We believe that all men and women are equally human, that order based on violence and injustice is not order. We do not believe that suffering needs to be in vain, that death is the end, nor that the disfigurement of our world is what God intended. But we dare to believe, always and despite everything, in God's power to transform and transfigure, 
fulfilling God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth where justice and peace flourish. Please be seated. And I would encourage you maybe to take a look at this uh, statement of faith through the week because it's a beautiful prayer. And so let us now go to God in prayer this day. O oh, gracious God, we are so thankful that you have given us the opportunity to gather here in person and on Facebook and in whatever way that we can through the week that you are with us, that you gather us together to be your people, to be your community of faith in this world. We ask you, O oh God, to help us to live lives of faith in the ordinary times of life that we'll be able to be with one another, to provoke one another, to spur each other on. Because God, you know that we need a nudge or two or 20 sometimes to help us just get through our days and to do what is right. Help us in the midst of this world to continue to keep our focus on Jesus, to keep our focus on the ways in which we have been taught. And help us to indeed encourage one another and lift each other up and to provoke us, provoke each other to, to good deeds and to love and to compassion. Oh God, help us this day and in the days ahead to hope and to hold on to the hope that we have in you. And as we gather this day, oh God, we also offer you prayers. There are so many prayers that are in our hearts, so many prayers that we say each day, so many needs that we see, so many joys that we experience. And today we offer you our prayers from our hearts and we pray especially this day for Lori Carrington who tested positive for COVID. May you continue to keep her well and we are thankful that she indeed got the booster and that others are doing so and that is keeping them from getting even sicker than they are or to just have mild symptoms. Oh God, we give you thanks for those who care for us and those who are doing things to help us to be healthy in this world in which there is so many things, so many uh, things that will do whatever it can or they can to tear us down, to make us ill. But we know that you are with us. We know that we are given ways in which we can find health and healing and wholeness, not only in body, but also especially in mind and soul. And for that, we are thankful. We also pray this day for Ed Beeler, who is diagnosed with brain cancer, such a scary diagnosis. May you be with him and his loved ones, especially with his wife, Kathy, as they walk this journey together. And may we continue to support him and them and their prayer in our prayers. And we pray also for their friends and also for Palm Schwenkfelder Church and the Ecumenical United Schwenkfelder Church where Ed is the music director. We know how much this must be affecting you know, what they are feeling this day and their worry for him. And we ask that you hold them all in your compassion and care and that you let them know that you are always with them. God, as we gather together today, we also know of many in our own community that are recovering or still dealing with medical issues or illness and we ask your healing touch upon them. We ask you, O oh God, to continue to help us to reach out in whatever way that we can through visits or phone calls or cards or meals or whatever you call us to do. And knowing that we cannot do this alone, that not one person is expected to do it alone, that we do all of these things together in your name and with you and with your spirit dwelling within us and leading us. So again, we thank you, O oh God, for all that you do, for your spirit that dwells within us, and for your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to live and also how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite Joanne Kramlick forward uh, for a stewardship moment. Good morning. Thank you. Now I know how the pastors feel. <laughs> what is OCWM? Our church, that is, it's our church's wider mission. And it's an important part of the covenant which binds individual members and congregations, conferences, and the national setting together to form the United Church of Christ. OCWM is the annual contribution congregations make to the UCC through our local conference to fund all the ways we strive together to make a more world, I'm sorry, a more just world for all. OCWM has four special offerings that sponsor vital ministries that bring hope and people to the U.S., in the U.S. and around the world. These four offerings are Neighbors in Need, One Great Hour of Sharing, Strengthening the Church, and the Christmas Fund. The four offerings give up or provide opportunities for individual members to contribute to the work of the wider UCC and its ecumenical partners. OCWM is the vehicle for Zwingli as a congregation to live out our promise of support. When you see OCWM as a line item in our budget, rejoice both because you know that OCWM is and more importantly, because, we, because you belong through Zwingli to a much larger and more world-changing church, the United Church of Christ. We at Zwingli are proud to be a five for five church. Now you may ask, what, say, what does that mean? This is to give, our church, to give to our church's wider mission and all four special mission offerings. As I said, the four offerings is one great hour of sharing, which is the fourth Sunday of Lent. Strengthening the church is on Pentecost Sunday. Neighbors in Need, the first Sunday in October. And you'll notice in your bulletin that there is a special thank you for the offerings that was collected. And I have to say it was a nice increase over last year's. And the last one is the Christmas fund, which is the Sunday before Christmas. And you can also find more information on these offerings if you go to the UCC website, and it's uccresources.com. This past week, you may have received your faith promise card. Well, mine's back at my chair. Um, and, but you also receive the time and talent sheet. So make sure you f complete these and hand them in as soon as possible. Take time to consider in your yearly contributions for your faith promise card. And also, you may be able to add a little extra for the OCWN offerings. Now is the time to prepare our offerings. For those in attendance, please place your offering envelope in the offering plates as you leave the sanctuary. At home, you may mail it in or just hit the donate button on the church's website. And also, don't forget, we also have the option to give electronically. Thank you. Sing along if you want. I
Will you pray with me? We return a portion of what we have received from you, O God, in gratitude for all that you have bestowed upon us. Bless this offering. Grant that it may continue to sustain and support the ministries of this church to bring the light of Christ into this community and the world beyond. Amen. I have a few announcements this morning. There's a lot going on in our community and in our church. Uh, this past week, the Bush House in Quakertown was condemned, and everyone living there had to leave their belongings behind, the majority of those belongings. Um, in the uh, lobby at the missioner's table, there is a list of items people from that housing area need just to get their basic needs met. And if you'd like to help, help them with this, um, they need to be dropped off by Thursday morning here at the church. Um, so see the missioners out in the lobby for more information about that. Also want to let you know that we found out that the Satterton Christmas Parade is back on this year. And I understand we have traditionally had a uh, entry in that parade, and so we're going to do that again this year um, on Saturday, December 4th. Be looking for more information on that in the next week or two um, as we get all of that set up. Um, wanted to also let you know that uh, the Bethany Children's Home Angel Tree is out in the lobby. Um, and on page 12 of your bulletin are details on that. Um, so you can find out what gifts they need and bring them back to us on December 5th. Um, on page 14, we have information about our Redemption of Cru Scrooge book study, uh, which will be four weeks. Uh, it should be a really good discussion. The book is fabulous. Um, so I hope that you'll join us in that. Information on purchasing the book and signing up are on page 14. And then also wanted to let you know that the Christmas tree is going up uh, next <coughs> Monday, a week from Monday. And so we are inviting you starting Monday afternoon through Wednesday at four o'clock, and then on Sunday morning before worship to bring your favorite ornament from home to help decorate our Christmas tree in the sanctuary. So we hope you'll participate in that as well. And I think, that's a lot of announcements, I think I got them all, I think. Um, and so now we will continue in worship by singing number 22, sing a new song to the Lord. <laughs> 